Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I'm continuing with the study of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. And today I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. In the KJV, it reads, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Hmm. Um, this is uh, something that is uh, always... Uh, puzzled me. Um, maybe, uh, maybe you, uh, as a viewer, uh, can provide an answer for me on this. And the the problem I have is, um, it says that these were certain came from James. So these were men from James. Uh, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. James was the Lord's brother. Uh, James is the one that uh, made the first decree um, 11 years after Pentecost, uh, one year after uh, Peter preached to Cornelius, and finally Gentiles are getting saved. But James made the decree that after an argument, uh, he decided, that, well, the, the Gentiles, they don't ne necessarily have to become Jews and practice all of Judaism as, as like we do. But uh, we, we are going to require that they, they don't fornicate and they don't eat meat that was strangled. Uh, so at that time, uh, and as I said, from Pentecost all the way for 20, 30 years, 30 years after Pentecost, the fight was still going on over what role does Judaism play in Christianity? And uh, in the beginning, uh, it was believed by the first believers, they were all Jews, it was believed by them that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised one that came and, uh, and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead. All that was believed, but they also believed that they were Jew Jewish people they, and they should continue practicing Judaism. Not only that they should, but they must. So um, all these Jewish believers thought it was faith in Jesus plus practice Judaism. And immediately when the Gentiles started getting saved, uh, it, the first impulse from them was that now, well, they've got to become Jews too, because it's a formula. Faith in Jesus plus practice Judaism equals salvation. Um, but um, this, this first decree was a result of an argument where uh, Peter argued, no, we can't impose that on them. We weren't even able to do it. So Peter understood that, uh, look, the, this Judaism, the law, we've never been able to do it. No one can do it. So why are, we, why are you talking about imposing Judaism on the Gentiles when we Jews can't even practice it perfectly. Um, so James came up with this decree. He apparently felt that he had to impose some kind of legalistic requirements on them because it, it couldn't be just entirely faith in Jesus. You, we're going to have to also require them to do something. Uh, and so the, the kind of the compromise was, well, at least 
that we don't want him fornicating and uh, eating strangled meat. Strangled meat, I don't understand the significance of that. I've never tried to, tried to um, uh, you know, study that. If, if you have an answer on that, then let me, let me know. But here's my, here's my point, and here's my problem. Um, Peter was always bold and brash and quick. He was quick to speak up, and that often got him into trouble. Uh, there's many examples of uh, him being the first to say, uh, uh, he, he said that, uh, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. Uh, you know, he's going, no, you're too, you're too good. I'm too, too low. You can't be washing my feet. And then, of course, Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you can have no part of, of this, of me. Um, so, uh, and then Peter wanted to walk on the water. So he spoke up and said, Lord, can I come to you? And so he started walking on the water. Uh, he was the first to speak up and, and, and say, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, but then he also said that uh, I would never deny you. And Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. Uh, and he said, I will never deny you. So he was kind of quick to speak. One of the things in the book of James, probably one of the very few things in the book of James that uh, I like, uh, is that it says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But uh, Peter was quick to speak. And um, so he was bold, and, but he, why did he uh, back down and seem to be so intimidated and afraid to stand up to James overall? Now, in, in this first case, it's the, the, the first decree by James that I just mentioned, Peter did stand up to James and the Jerusalem church and, and said, I'm going to do what the Lord said. The Lord gave me a vision and told me to go to Cornelius' house. And uh, the Lord directed me to preach the gospel to them. The Lord told me that um, nothing is unclean, so the dietary law no longer applies. Uh, the Lord said to me that nothing is unclean, so Gentiles are acceptable and we can associate with them. We don't need to segregate from the Gentiles. Uh, so I'm going to do what the Lord said, not what James or Peter, or, I mean, or James or uh, anybody else says. So in this case, he stood up to James. But in other cases, it seems that he is intimidated by James. Now, it's, it's basically, it's universally accepted that James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. Of course, the, ch the church began in Jerusalem. That's where Pentecost experience uh, happened in Jerusalem. Uh, the, and so it, it started in Jerusalem and expanded outwardly from Jerusalem. So maybe they thought that because James was the Lord's brother. There was some kind of a uh, passing down the, your, your, the position to the heir. Uh, James was the heir to Jesus. I mean, I've, I've heard some people say that's why James was uh, elevated, had this, this great status. Um, but all the, um, then there's another example of Paul uh, Paul being, again, very, very bold, really standing firm for the gospel is faith alone in Christ alone and no works are required and don't you dare add any works, to, whether it's circumcision or any part aspects of Judaism. If you add anything to it, you ruined it and it has no value. 
So Paul stood for that. He fought for that. He defended that. And yet, uh, when it came time for Paul to go to, uh, uh, he was in Jerusalem, uh, and they basically there was a great uh, outrage against Paul because they were saying, this is the one that's going all over the world telling Jews to stop practicing Judaism. So they're, they were very upset with, with Paul because he's telling them the law and Judaism no longer applies. And uh, so you got to drop Judaism to be a Christian. And there was a lot of anger. In fact, they even swore a pact that they were going to kill Paul because of this. Uh, but at that time, uh, James directed Paul to shave his head and do some ritual ceremony in the temple. Now, P Paul didn't believe in any of the rituals and ceremonies of, of, of Judaism any longer. Uh, I'm sure he felt that there was a time and place for it. It served its purpose, but now that's over and we must not uh, do that. And yet, when James told Paul, shave your head and do, do this, Paul did it. So uh, uh, why is it that, James, that, that Peter and Paul both like submitted to the demands of James? Answer that question for me. If you have an answer, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on, on that. But this, that's what this is we're getting into right here in this portion of uh, chapter two is that we have verse 12, for before that certain came from James. So be before these men came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. So this is saying that Peter was eating with the Gentiles, but when the men from James came, he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Uh, it says, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. Because Jews always separate themselves, segregated themselves from Gentiles. Uh, that was the first problem when he preached to, Peter preached to uh, Cornelius. The first outrage is, how can you associate with a Gentile, you actually associated with one of them? You went into their a Gentile home? You ate with the Gentile? You told the Gentiles about Jesus? So, um, uh, this uh, segregated society where Jew would have nothing to do with Gentiles, like, unless there was some, there was absolutely no way out of it, they, they wouldn't... Um, associate with them. Uh, but here, we're told that well, James, yeah, James, uh, I mean, uh, Peter, he, he he always ate with the Gentiles. He associated with them. He wasn't prejudiced against them. He accepted them as, as, as brothers and sisters, as brethren uh, in the faith. And he ate with them. And he was even eating Gentile food. He wasn't even eating kosher food anymore. So he, he wasn't uh, one uh, segregating himself from the Gentiles, and two, he wasn't following the dietary laws anymore. So in verse 12, it says, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, fearing them which came from James, the men from James. He was afraid of them, of these men from James. What was he afraid of? Why was he afraid and intimidated uh, by James and the Jerusalem church that these were Judaizers? These were the people who were, uh, you know, uh, tampering with Paul's churches and, and Paul's gospel uh, that, uh, and uh, being a thorn in Paul's flesh and just creating a huge problem for Paul. And yet, when they came, Peter switched sides and left the Gentile table and joined them. 
So let me read 11 and 12 in the Amplified. Now when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face about his conduct there because he stood condemned by his own actions before certain uh, men came from James. He used to eat his meals with the Gentiles. But when the men from Jerusalem arrived, he began to withdraw and separate himself from the Gentile believers because he was afraid of those from the circumcision. From the circumcision, uh, the footnote on that is self-righteous Jewish converts who twisted the gospel to suit their legalistic beliefs. They observed the Mosaic law and would not eat with Gentile believers. Okay, so uh, Peter was afraid of James. He was afraid of the Judaizers, the men from James, even though he stood up to them uh, you know, originally, right after he preached to Cornelius, he did stand his ground and defended the gospel and defended the, uh, the uh, directions that he got directly from God. Um, uh, he stood his the ground then. But it seems like Peter's strength and his uh, um, conviction, uh, it, it, it waned. For, uh, you know, he, he did not continue to stand up against James and the Judaizers and the false gospel that uh, that uh, faith in Jesus is not enough. you got to convert to Judaism. All right, now let's go to uh, verse 13 in the KJV. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. So the, 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 there were other Jewish believers uh, uh, that, that were... They were associating with the, the Gentiles, just like Peter was, and you know they, they were over this uh, hatred and uh, the segregation uh, of uh, Jew and Gentile. Uh, they they were over that. They accepted the Gentiles. They had fellowship with them. Uh, they accepted them as as brethren uh, in the faith, and yet the other Jews, when Peter left the Gentiles and went with the men from James. The other Jews did too. And, uh, probably not all of them, maybe all of them. It says, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Well, it wasn't everybody because uh, you know, Paul, Paul didn't do it. So, or maybe, I don't even know if Paul was there at the time or if Paul is lecturing him about, I know that this happened. In Antioch, this is what you did. Uh, I'm not sure if Paul was uh, actually in Antioch when that happened. I, I guess he was not, but he heard about it. He got the report about what happened. Uh, and so in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Hmm. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at 13 in the Amplified. The rest of the Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, ignoring their knowledge that Jewish and Gentile Christians were united under the new covenant into one faith, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. So there's something about James, the Jerusalem church, and that... Um, um, Standing up uh, against them was was uh, maybe a scary thing to do. You just look. The, the men from James came, and immediately they all left the Gentiles and they went with the men from James, and uh, not just uh, Peter, but the other Jewish believers and even Barnabas. Now, back to the KJV, verse fourteen. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, see, what does that mean? They walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. These people didn't believe the gospel. They were, as it said in the, the, the last video, 
these were false brethren. They weren't really even saved, these Judaizers, because they never put their faith entirely in Jesus. Uh, they, their faith was divided, believing in Jesus and believing in their own righteousness that they established by following Judaism. Um, so it says, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, so, so, so uh, Paul was there. He was an eyewitness to all this. He didn't just hear about it later, I guess. It says, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews. Huh. So, Paul is, uh, he's standing up really to, not just Peter, but he's standing up to James, the, the men from James, the, the Judaizers, the false gospel, says they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. They didn't have the true gospel. Let me read 14 in the Amplified. But when I saw that they were not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas, that, that's Peter, in front of everyone, if you, being a Jew, live as you have been living. So see, Peter, before the men from James got there, <laughs> he wasn't following uh the, uh, uh, the dietary laws. He, he he was not segregating himself from Gentiles. He was associating with them. He accepted them as brother brothers, and he and he ate with them, and he ate Gentile food. So if you, being a Jew, live as you have been living, like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how is it that you are now virtually forcing the Gentiles to live like Jews if they want to eat with you. So uh, a lot in this verse, there's a lot in that verse that these people, they have a false gospel. Uh, and, and, uh, and that uh, Peter was a coward, just like he, he was afraid to... Uh, Say, I, I'm an apostle of Jesus. I've been with him all these years and uh, I believe in him. No, he said, I never knew him. I don't know what you're talking about. He denied him three times. So he, here he has, the, we have this real conflict going on within Peter. On one hand, he's, he's impulsive and bold. On the other hand, he's a coward. Uh, now let's go to verse 15. In the KJV, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, by, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, um, this verse 16, of course, it's, it's one of the go-to verses that we use uh, to support and prove that salvation is not by works, it's by faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, this is one of our great go-to verses that there can be no misunderstanding. It's clear, it's explicit. It's, uh, no one can really debate uh, what it's saying. It's clear cut. Um, but uh, uh, now we have the context of this verse 16. It's in the midst of all of this um, dispute and this challenge and this uh, calling out of Peter and Barnabas and all of the Jewish believers by Paul. 
So right in the midst of all that, Paul says, I'll read that in the Amplified. He says, uh, Yet we know that a man is not justified and placed in right standing with God by works of the law, but only through faith in God's beloved Son, Christ Jesus. And even we as Jews have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. By observing the law, no one will ever be justified that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty. Okay. Now, there's other things in verse 16 that I think are, are worth uh, um, uh, stopping here a little longer and, and uh, trying to really consider. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, we know that uh, Jesus um, is eternal God Almighty. Uh, God came down from heaven God was manifest in the flesh. God was made flesh and lived among us as a man, Jesus Christ, our Savior, God, man. Um, and yet, uh, it says, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, what is faith? Bible gives a definition of faith. It says faith is the substance of, of um, the, faith is the substance of uh, oh man, how can I forget this? And it's substance of and the evidence of things not seen. Oh boy. Faith is the substance. Let me look that up here real quick. Faith is, oops. Oh no, faith is, faith is the substance. Let me see if I can find it real quickly. Okay, that's Hebrews 11, one it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Um, so, let's go back to Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And um, the Bible also says that uh, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So when, when it says we walk by faith, not by sight, and it's the evidence of things not seen, so faith is, is believing something that you haven't seen. Um, that you're, there's no, um, there's no, uh, the senses are not involved. You didn't see it, taste it, touch it. There's nothing really to you can rest your laurels. You can put confidence in. So therefore, you have to just believe it without having seen it, and that's faith. Well, in, in the case of Jesus, though, he is God. Does God have faith? If God has faith, doesn't that mean that there's things that he doesn't know, and he just has to have faith in it? He doesn't. He he hasn't seen it. Well, God is all seeing, all knowing. Uh, so I, I just think that the way this is phrased here, um, if a person uh, was to take this uh, structure of the sentence here, the, where is it? I'm sorry. OK, 
Okay. Okay. By the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I don't think that we can take that to mean that Jesus Christ had faith. Um, I think Jesus Christ knew. He had certainty because he's, he's God. Uh, so what, what else could it mean? But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, it could mean by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus in the garden was asked the Father, Lord, if this is po if it's possible, take this this uh, cup from me. Uh, but he, but if it's not possible, I'm you know I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'll be faithful. So he willingly and faithfully went to the cross, knowing that how much he would suffer and die for our sake. So. Uh, when it says, knowing that a man is not justified by, the, justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, I would I take it to mean, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, because Jesus was faithful, willing to go to the cross, knowing how much he was going to suffer, and yet he was willing and faithful to do it anyway. And then it says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, um, and not by the works of the law. Now, if we look at verse the chapter, I mean, verse 16 in the Amplified and see how it's phrased. Uh, it says, Yet we know that a man is not justified and placed in right standing with God by works of the law, but only through faith in God's beloved Son, Christ Jesus. So here in the Amplified, and I would, I would, uh, without taking the time to look, I would suggest that probably many other translations, they phrase it that way too, that it says, uh, through faith in Christ. So we're justified by faith in Christ. Uh, now, All right, well, that's en enough of that, but uh, um, let's go to verse 17 in the KJV. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Let's look at that in the Amplified. But if, while we seek to be justified in Christ by faith, we ourselves are found to be sinners, does that make Christ an advocate or promoter of our sin? Certainly not. <coughs> and this is something we find quite often in Paul's letters, where he asks a question that I, I think that... Uh, He's commonly asked. He's asked by the, the false teachers in the, the argument between him and the false teacher. Um, uh, particularly in, in Romans uh, chapter 1 and, and, and 2, uh, I did a, a little, uh, several videos uh, on the subject of prosopopoeia. Uh, was, was Paul a diatribalist? Prosopopoeia. Uh, and if you haven't seen that, I think there's only three or four videos. That I don't think it's more than 30 minutes total. But the point is that um, I believe that Paul did use the technique of prosopopoeia, which is, um, look, I'm the only one here. There's nobody else in my office. It's just me. And you're, so I'm speaking to you, the audience. But if I uh, wanted to present to you my views and compare them to the false teacher's views, uh, I could speak as as though I am the false teacher, and then you know, now I'm presenting you my views. So I believe that's what Paul did 
in uh, in Romans. Uh, so watch that that playlist I have about prosopopoeia, and you'll understand better what I'm getting at here. But many times Paul he pre he asks a question not because he's asking it, not because he's wondering about it, but because this is a question that it is asked by the opponents, by the false teachers. So he asks, and then he answers. So he's asking the question as though he's representing the false teacher's point of view, and then he gives us the answer. Um, uh, so he says, uh, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So he's he's answering the, the, the charge against him and his teachings, basically, that, hey, you're promoting sin. You're giving people a license to sin. And so Paul presents the false teacher's point of view, and he says, no, God forbid, that's not the case at all. Um, so look, look at verse 18 in the KJV. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Let's look at 18 and 19 in the Amplified. For if I, or anyone else, should rebuild through the word or by practice, what I once tore down, that's the, the belief that observing the law is essential for salvation. So Paul once believed that observing the law was essential for salvation. And now he's saying that, no, I've rejected that. I've torn that down. I fought against that false teaching. And, and he says, if I try to rebuild it again, he says, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And no, he's not, he's not, uh, going to um, go back and and uh, support the following the law is essential for salvation. Uh, he believed it in the past. Now he knows it's wrong. He's rejected it, and he's fought against it. He's certainly not going to go back and uh, bring that back in to uh, salvation as a formula. The faith in Jesus plus following the law is the formula for salvation. No. He says, no way. Uh, verse 20 in the KJV, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, and 20 in the Amplified says, I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Of course, the Bible says that when we put our faith in Christ, that Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. Uh, and uh, so it's saying that we have been crucified along with Christ. We share his crucifixion. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. That is, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Um, I love the, the Amplified. Now, this is, I've seen this over and over and over again. When they amplify, and that's really all I'm doing. This, this uh, whole study is titled the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. So I'm going through this one verse at a time, reading the verse, and then commenting or amplifying it. I'm exp ex expounding 
upon the scriptures, telling you my thoughts, what I, uh, some of the things that I uh, get from the scriptures that maybe you already understand, or maybe it's newest to you. Uh, but um, when it says, um, uh, when in the in the amplified translation, it's amplifying. Uh, it's it, um, it's taking the the translators who wrote the amplified translation. They're giving you their thoughts, just as I'm giving you my thoughts on it. So that's really, we have the benefit of not only me, Sin City Preacher, Brother Luke, for giving you my thoughts, but we have also the thoughts of the translators of the Amplified Translation, uh, their thoughts as they amplify or expound upon the scriptures here. So, but when they do this, I've noticed when this subject comes up, they often use the same terms that I like to use. And it says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith. Now, then it says in parentheses, after the word faith, it says, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God. So, uh, I've, I made a video, Faith, the One Requirement. Um, and I've, uh, I, I've talked about all the different words and phrases that we can use to, to uh, give us a better understanding, more insight as to what is faith, what does it mean to believe, what does it mean to have faith. And I like the words that they've used in here. I've, I've done it, many, many people are using this now. I'm so happy that they say, believing in Jesus means that you're, uh, uh, you're, um, you're relying on Jesus. You're completely trusting Jesus. Uh, and to me, that would be the definition of a, of a Christian. A Christian is someone who relies completely on Jesus Christ for their salvation. We're relying on him. We're depending on him. That's why believing in him. We believe in his ability to give us eternal life. As a matter of fact, we believe he alone has the ability to give us eternal life. We believe in his faithfulness to keep his promise. He promised, if you believe in me, if you trust me, I will give you eternal life as a free gift and uh, you're going to go to heaven, I guarantee it. This is a promise from Jesus. And the Bible says that God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. So uh, we are, we're depending uh, on this and we're believing in his faithfulness to keep his promise. Um, now let's go to the last verse of the chapter. Verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Um, frustrate. Um, I guess we've all been frustrated. I, you know, sadly, I, I get frustrated almost every day. There are situations I have to deal with every day, uh, just uh, in, in dealing with life, particularly dealing with the false teachers, that I, it is frustrating to me. Um, and frustrate, well, I don't want to necessarily look up the word, what the word frustrate means, but it means that something is not happening, something's failing to happen, because it's being frustrated. Uh, I want to get from point A to point B, but I'm not able to get there because uh, something is frustrating my effort to get there. Uh, so let's look at this in the Amplified. It says, I do not ignore or nullify the gracious gift of the grace of God. Um, so... Um, 
nullify. Nullify means that uh, um, it it's, has no, uh, it's, it's null and void. It has no uh, power, it has no, there's, has no effect. It, it, uh, it, it will not accomplish what we want it to because it's been nullified. Um, so I do not frustrate or I do not nullify the grace of God. I do not cancel out the grace of God. For if righteousness come by law, then Christ is dead in vain. Dead in vain, it means that his death on the cross accomplished nothing. It, it's uh, meaningless. It's pointless. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not effective. It has no value. It has no power. If we believe that righteousness comes by the law, then that's what that's what happens to Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. It is meaningless. It's pointless. It's uh, has no power. It has no value. It has, there's no there's no way you can be saved. And there's no saving power if a person believes. And they say, "Well, yeah, I I believe that Jesus died for my sins." I believe he rose from the dead, and uh, and I and uh, yeah, those are all true. Well, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? Well, uh, I don't know. It depends on how well I follow the law. If I'm religious enough, and uh, if I do enough good things, then God will will accept me then. Well, what? What a person does when they add following the law as a requirement instead of just faith, what they're doing is they're nullifying it, they're canceling it out, they're making have no power, no saving power. And, and Christ's death on the cross was for nothing. He died in vain, if that's the case. So it's, it's not enough just to, to believe that these are historical facts. Jesus really was a real person. He really died on that cross, and uh, when he died, he paid for our sins. Uh, uh, well, really? If you really believe he paid for your sins, why aren't you certain you're gonna to go to heaven then if your sins are paid for? Um, it, it, it makes no sense, but, and yet, there's over a billion Roman Catholics that will tell you, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus, but they don't believe that they're saved because of it. They believe they're saved if they follow the law, if they get baptized, if they go to confession, communion, and uh, follow the golden rule, and uh, all, all these lists. There's a long, long list of requirements that the religious people, not just Roman Catholics, but all the, the religions of the world, all the various uh, uh, sects, of Christendom, they all add things. And sometimes they're adding one thing like water baptism. Sometimes they add a whole laundry list of things. But when you do that, then uh, you're making Christ's death on the cross of no value, it accomplished nothing. Uh, and you're not saved if you think that, uh, oh, well, you do believe, oh, you got your facts straight, but you don't believe that that's how you get saved by relying and trusting the person of Jesus and the finished work of Jesus. Um, all right, so let me look at these footnotes here, see if there's anything else that uh, would be helpful. Okay. Uh, on Galatians 2.16, it says, uh, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And the footnote on that is, Being justified is a legal or judicial declaration of righteousness. Justification has two parts. Being declared free of blame, acquitted of sin, not guilty. Believers are justified because 
Um, Jesus Christ personally assumed the guilt for our sin on the cross. And two, God declares the right the person righteous, that is, placed in a position of right standing with him. A person may not be made righteous by his personal behavior, no matter how good or by or by the declaration of any other human being. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 2. Uh, next time I'll pick it up with uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 1. So, um, I appreciate you watching. Uh, I, I also hope that you will give me some feedback. If you think I'm wrong in any point, please take the time to not just say you're wrong, you're a false teacher, but, but, but explain to me how I'm wrong exactly. Be, be thorough and tell me. Because if I'm wrong, uh, I don't want to remain wrong. But the one, I asked a question in this video about why is it that Peter and, and Paul were seemed to be intimidated, at least part of the time. I know Peter stood up to, to James um, regarding Cornelius and the Gentile believers. Um, uh, and then James made this compromise, the, the, his first decree. Um, but then after that, look how he cowered and, and uh, was afraid to, to uh, stand up to the Judaizers, uh, the, the men from James, when it came to eating with the, and associating with the Gentiles. Why is it that Peter was so intimidated by James and the men from James? And even Paul, as, as bold as he was, as great as he was, as strong as he was defending the gospel, and yet when James ordered him to shave his head and go through this ceremony in, in the temple, Paul agreed to do it. So if you have answers for that, I'd love to hear it. Thank you very much and bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.